Awesome. Well, officially, Cheers. welcome. Cheers to happy hour, everybody. We um, decanted the 11 because older wines, they've been trapped in the bottle for so long. They need, they need to come out and open up a little. So, uh, and uh, they definitely taste better with some air. So, um, one of the reasons that we thought that the uh, older bottle of carriage house would be really good for today is we're going to talk about corks. And while we do use screw caps for the train station wines, the, all the Cote Bonneville wines that are intended to age are, um, they're all, uh, closed with corks and, um, there are a variety of different corks. We went to Portugal. I went to Portugal with Amarin, the uh, company we get corks from in, well, I went with my egg forestry group and my friend Barb is supposed to be showing up today. She's not here yet, but, um, cause she went with me. We went to Spain and Portugal and then with Amarum got us into the cork forest, which is apparently really hard to do, but it's just fascinating. And everybody else in the group who are not winemakers, they all came away from that trip going, I had never looked at a bottle of cork or I'd never looked at a cork. I never thought about a cork. There's a lot that goes into cork and there's a lot of variation within corks and how they're the quality levels and different things. And it's really, uh, we spent an entire day learning about it and um, they were they were really fascinated. So I am excited to have Michelle here from Amram as well to talk about uh, how we, how they make the corks that serve, that close the wine, that we use to close the wines that make the wines age so well. And um, as always, we're gonna start in the vineyard and talk about where this wine comes from. Um, Adrish, where's the wine come from? <laughs> where does wine come from? <laughs> What? Where does the wine come from? What? Yeah, where does the wine come from? Where, where, in, the, where in the vineyard? It's quiz time. Oh, the, the, the carriage house. Sorry. I thought you were just like, where does wine come from in general? <laughs> the wine. This. Um, I don't know. This wine. Hey, I, for, so can I just say, I'm finally, I'm back on track. I'm drinking the, the wine of the, of, of the week. Oh, um, good job. Good yeah. job. Um, I don't know the the hill and the the park below the hill, the cab and the Merlot. <laughs> Somewhere in the farm. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who knows where this wine comes from? Who can pay attention better than a drish? Come on, any takers? I can't. I where know. did that go? It's right. I can't, I'm not by the computer, but it's that flat that's right by the area that you pull in. Yes, yes, perfect. Right. Good answer, Aaron. All right. Tell uh -huh. me the weather. Um, so it is this part of the vineyard, which is Cabernet so. and the Cabernet Franc over here. And then this soil profile continues around. And so the Merlot is down around at the bottom of, of the hill down there too. Um, the soil profile for this is completely different from the hillside. And it's different every vintage, but in a year like 11, 11 was actually the uh, coldest year on record in Eastern Washington. And so because we're in that me intermediate temperature profile, in a warm year, we trend more Bordeaux-like. In a cool year, we trend more Bordeaux-like. No, in a warm year, we trend Napa. Yeah, Napa. Okay, warm year, we trend Napa. Cool year, we trend Bordeaux. Um, so, and this, vintage being cool you get more of those bordeaux flavors you get we got pretty significant heat accumulation difference between this lower planting because it's cooler down here because not being on a hillside not being on a slope you don't get as much heat you get more heat if you're on a hillside it it adds for every three degrees of slope. of slope you get one degree of temperature so um this is a cooler part of the vineyard in a especially in a year like 11 than this hillside so it's um in addition to the soil differences that we've talked about each week where this is um you get that you get those temperature differentiations which is yet another reason that looking at vintage variation and tasting the coat versus the carriage house um whether they be in the same year or in in very different growing seasons are is really interesting but the, 
the soil profile in this part of the vineyard, you can see from up in the hills above, there's 40,000 acres that, that drain down into here. So over the millennia, when we've had flooding events, when we get a lot of rain in a short period of time, you get material coming from higher up in those hillsides. So smaller, um, it's not one big rock like the hill, it's more of the cobblestone flood derived particles, but a lot of them are very ancient soils um, and, and basalt derived with less like a lot of things in Eastern Washington are. Um, and so it's really, it's, it's a fun sense of place with Carriage House. Um, and we're pairing that today. Let me go back to my mom made. So this is eggplant caviar food. And it's a, it's a family recipe. We've been making it for a long, long time. It's yeah. kind of a favorite. Um, it doesn't show up on Zoom. It's great for, I don't know how many people, do people make it? Do they make it? Becky? Uh, I knew you were going to ask, but uh, we're going to make it after happy hour today. Oh, okay. It was a lot of, the list of ingredients <laughs> is long. The, uh, the actual put it together time doesn't take very much, but the no. list of ingredients was pretty long for me to send out on a holiday Monday. So it's um it's a it can be warm with dinner it can be cold it can be either way you can have a hot appetizer cold appetizer it can be a side dish at dinner it's a great thing to do when you have an abundance at the end of the year of the eggplant and the peppers and all those things that you grow in your garden um you can just pop it in your Cuisinart and pulse it and cook it and it, it freezes well it's really versatile so like I said and it pairs with carrot chops and yeah I, I hope it goes with carrot chops <laughs> we had a few um. I found some blue tortillas in um, in the store, which I thought was kind of cool. So I just made some blue tortilla chips with it. But you can corn chips. Uh, I like it a lot with um, triscuits. It's also good on like toast. Break, yeah. yeah, toast for breakfast. It's just it's so versatile and it's really healthy. So that's and I think it does pair well with the um, mm -hmm. carrot toast. So that's the the foods, the recipe. And then, Dad, be prepared. We're going to unmute you. Da, 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 da. Da, 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 da. All right. I'm gonna Let's talk about what's happening in the vineyard. Oh, OK. I thought you were going to put a slide in. I am. <laughs> OK, so the first slide is the um, Chardonnay, I mean, the Syrah that we've been tracking that's uh, came out uh, sooner than the Cabernet, which we'll talk about next. And you can see how it's continuing to grow. You can see the clusters uh, that are apparent. Um, and then there, when we do a close up, there's a little, a little change in the, the clusters that'll be more apparent with the Cabernet vine. But uh, if you remember just, um, April the 6th was bud break and we've come this far. And so in the next week is when we typically will see bloom. And so that's the next big deal. So uh, you wanna switch to the cab. And these pictures were taken this morning. And uh, so you can see the growth, you can see where it's been thinned. Uh, and then on the close up of the cluster here, you can see there a uh, little um, pitting that is present and that's where each of those are going to open up and the bloom will occur and so it's starting instead of just being around green ball it's uh, going into the next phase and so next week when you see it some of these should be opened up for you so i think this is really cool because a lot of people don't always realize that um, that grapes flower as well, but you can see in this picture the individual flower petals that then will open up. And instead of opening up this way, like a lot of flowers do, they actually open the caps. The caps will pop off, and the petals release off the top, and the flower parts are underneath. So and they have an aromatics too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they do smell. Yeah. Um, in fact, the valley, when, when all the concords and the wine grapes and everything are blooming, it has, you can smell it in the air. Yeah, it's really, it's really fun. So I'm posting more of the vineyard post 
pictures. And especially as we get into times like Bloom and Verasion where things are happening and changing every day, I'm posting more of those on the DeBrule Vineyard Instagram page than on any of the Copanaville stuff. So if you want to follow it, head over there and make sure that you're following along. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing and then Okay, am I still, am I still live? You're still live. Okay, uh, and so um, in consideration of the normal mile markers for this year, we thought we were a week behind, but uh, at this point we're a, a couple of days behind, and then we're gonna get two days of low 90 degree temps towards the end of this week. And uh, what could happen with Bloom is it can just go bang uh, with that heat and have um, everything roll along at once instead of a cool, drawn out, rainy, windy spring. So uh, that's another thing that we're keeping an eye on is the weather forecast and the high heat that's coming. So we'll give you an update next week. Yeah. All right, any questions for dad before I shut him back down? <laughs> All right. And... <laughs> You're getting muted. <laughs> so, all right, I am going to, Michelle, are you ready? All right, so let's go to Portugal. All right, fabulous. Well, um, thank you again, Carrie, for, for asking me to join. I think this is really exciting um, to get an update in the vineyard and be able to taste the wine with some friends all across the country. So um, thank you all. And I'm really excited to, to share some of what I know about cork. Uh, and like Carrie had mentioned prior to uh, working with Amaram cork, I, I really didn't give much thought to the type of closure or what was, um, you know, keeping the wine in the bottle, right? It was just uh, what, was, what, what was easy to open um, and kind of what, what was, you know, best for the packaging, I guess you could say. Um, but the more I started to learn about Cork, the more I started to realize it's such a versatile and unique product. Um, and so what I'd like to share with you today, I'm going to start to share. Uh, that look good? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, great. Um, so as we begin about Cork today, um, it definitely is a huge advantage to wineries um, that are very thoughtful and conscientious uh, with regards to their impact on, on the environment. So um, really what I want to focus on today is I'm going to be sharing with you an overview of the cork industry, where cork actually comes from and how cork um, is produced. And, and then I'll also talk with you about why to use cork closure. So what does it actually mean to, to the wine um, that's in the bottle? Perfect. Okay, great. So Moving on here, and if anybody has any questions, please feel free to stop me along the way. Um, I do have a short video that I'd like to share because uh, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words and it does a much better job of showing our production facility um, than I could uh, hope to describe, but um, we'll get to that part in just a moment. Okay, um, so raw cork production. Predominantly raw cork comes from the Mediterranean basin. Um, and so majority of the cork is going to be found in the countries of Portugal, Spain, and Morocco. Um, so cork is actually harvested annually. So we're able to harvest a cork tree every nine years. Um, and what they do is it's very highly skilled labor. They actually strip the bark from the outside of the cork tree. Um, so the cork is harvested exclusively from the cork oak tree, the Quera subra. Um, and so these are the predominant growing regions. Now here on the map, you can see um, a better idea as to the production regions, but also the cork production by country. And so you can see for its size, Portugal is a large manufacturer of cork. I myself work for the uh, world's largest cork company, Amarum Cork. Uh, it's a 150 year old Portuguese cork company um, and is one of the leading research and development companies for the cork industry. Um, in, in whole. So not only the cork that we put in our bottle, but the cork that, you know, um, goes up on the space shuttle with our, our astronauts um, and, uh, you know, the cork that you can actually make products and household goods from. So 
AMRAM is fully vertically integrated. And so we are very heavily invested in the sustainability and long-term um, health of the cork industry. And so that includes protecting these beautiful forests. Um, so this is the Montando or a picture of the Montando in Portugal. And so as you can see on the tree closest to us, this is going to be a tree that was recently had a haircut, okay? Uh, so this tree was recently harvested and you can You're see- You're making everybody jealous if the, if the tree can get a haircut and without a, nobody else can. You are so, I know, I know, you are so right there. Um, and so looking at that, so when they're harvesting, you can kind of see the second tree in the foreground. They actually mark all the trees. Um, so they mark them with one through nine. So they know the cyclical cycle in which they can harvest them. All of these cork oaks are hand harvested. And so really a cork in the bottle um, goes to protecting not only this natural habitat, but it also protects the local populations and the trained skilled workers um, that have to take, or that take care of these trees and steward these trees and these forests. And it also promotes biodiversity. So these forests in Portugal are actually protected by law. Um, and it provides home to a lot of uh, unique and endangered species. Um, one being the, um, the Iberian lynx. Um, so that's an endangered species that calls these cork forests home. And so cork forests are really important. And as we saw, a predominant amount of the cork that is used in the industry actually goes into wine. So keep popping those bottles, supporting cork trees, um, Portugal and throughout the Mediterranean basin. So um, now, 7 million acres of cork forests, um, they actually do a lot of heavy lifting, absorbing carbon dioxide. Uh, absorbing carbon dioxide. And so I got a question before we go into what the trees do. How old were the trees in the photographs? So cork trees um, can live up to about 100 years, or 100 to 150 years. Um, but they can actually live longer and up to 200 years when they're regu regularly harvested. Um, so these trees in particular, I have not been as lucky as Carrie to actually go to Amarum to see the cork forests. Um, I was supposed to go in March this year and, and that was postponed. Um, so I wouldn't be able to give a, a guesstimate, but cork trees themselves can actually live um, very productive lives into well into almost 200 years. So um, 7 million acres of cork forests, um, and what these cork forests are doing as many plants, um, they're actually absorbing a large amount of carbon dioxide um, from the atmosphere and from the earth. So through that absorption, the carbon dioxide is actually um, contained and trapped inside of a cork. And so we'll talk about uh, a cork stopper. And actually, just to give you an idea, a cork stopper, a single cork stopper, can retain 309 grams of carbon dioxide. Um, so that's in a single cork stopper. And to give you an idea, that almost offsets the carbon footprint of the glass bottle that the wine is bottled in. Um, glass can offset anywhere from 300 to about 500 grams of carbon dioxide. Um, so cork, in fact, not only from the forest aspect, but also um, can help make um, the bottle of wine almost kind of carbon neutral. Um, and these are just some rough fix figures, you know, having a wholly natural product that not only as a raw material is taking carbon dioxide, sustainability is a huge part of what Amarum um, supports and is, is proud to promote. And so natural cork, um, again, as, as I said, is almost a carbon sink. And so a plastic closure can emit almost 10 times more carbon dioxide, whereas a screw cap can emit that 24 times. Um, so there is a difference as far as the type of closure um, and the impact of what that has. Perfect. Um, this is the other really neat thing as far as, and, and I'll get to the video in a second, but once we're producing the, the cork, um, so once we're producing the cork, we actually are able to supply 60% of our energy needs through biomass fuel. And that biomass fuel comes from the cork dust that's resultant as we're punching corks out of cork bark. So what I have in front of me is a cork bark that was aged at least nine years and then harvested from the tree. And then as you can see, and you'll sh I'll show in the video in just a moment, there's highly skilled labor that comes and punches each one of these corks out in the cork plank. 
Um, and so again, the, the part of our vacuum systems, we collect all that cork dust. Um, we also grind up all of this particulate and make technical corks. Um, so we're utilizing every part of the cork. Um, and again, another important part about what we do is our vertical integration. So we have a flooring division, we have a composites division, um, we have all other applications as well um, that can utilize cork in other industries. So again, yeah, implement of a circular economy model, turning production waste into CO2 and a natural source of energy. So that's from the manufacturing side. Now I'm gonna hope, I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope the sound works, but if it doesn't, it's still a great visual. And I can probably send this out to you guys later too. So um, if it's a little smoother, it might be easier to see. Carrie, I can see you. Hey, Barb. Hi, look what I have. I gotta find you. Is it coming through okay? Or should I continue to play it or probably skip? Um, I think it's pause. I'll, I can send it out to everybody afterwards. Okay. And um, I'll get and to the part where the, uh, they're actually. Well, here we go. Oh, there we go. Hey, no, Brian, like... come look at this. So, yeah, because this part's really cool. Where the. Uh, yeah, so they don't just get harvested and go straight into the corks. And, uh, but they grow. Mm -hmm. They season them just like they season the barrels. For how long? For how long, Michelle? Um, they up to like, they, uh, it varies, um, but I believe up to 15 months. Yeah. It's also crazy because just like we had a couple of uh, barrel people talk uh this is it's the same genus it's a different species and, and cork oaks are the only species of tree that you can take the bark of the tree off and not kill the tree yeah no it's incredible how renewable it is so this is where they're hand punching after they boil the planks to flatten them so kind of what we have here Yeah, we so when when Barb and I went to Portugal, we did not go to a, uh, the facility where they were doing the the manual hand punching of corks. We were in the south of Portugal, but they were they um, harvested the trees and they had those stacks of ink or laser engraving. Many of them proudly bearing the names of the best wines on the planet. Technical stoppers such as Helix. Twin top or spark. Um, so yeah, so that and then it goes into our technical stoppers, um, and uh, which you all would be interested. But a technical stopper is what we would refer to as a micro agglomerated. Um, so it's ground up cork particulate, and then it's molded together. Um, so. um, but yeah, I wanted to share because the cork manufacturing is so unique. I wanted to share that with you all, just so you could see from our production floor. Um, so again, as I mentioned, cork is used for a variety of different industries and in a variety of different applications. Um, and so from a value standpoint, Wine Stoppers represents the largest segment and predominant where cork is used. And the reason why is because it's so unique to have a, I mean, this is still at the end of the day, it's a piece of bark. Um, and it's very unique to have a piece of bark in such high quality that it can go inside a bottle of wine. And so what they were showing with the sorting and the hand selecting, that's, um, and they're actually starting to use optical sorting as well on, on elements of sorting. We grade all of our natural cores based on the visual aesthetics. So 
the, the, the prettier, you know, the cork, the kind of the quality. Um, it doesn't have any um, impact on their performance, but it's a preference for a lot of winemakers, how their corks look. And so that's, uh, that's important. Um, because of course, that's gonna be one of the first things that you see as that, uh, as that cork uh, screw goes into the bottle. So it's an important detail. And moving on. So this is probably a better picture of the, the piece of bark that I have in front of me, but talking about why you would use natural, natural cork. Um, natural cork has a lot of unique physical attributes, um, allowing it to be very compressible, it's elastic. Um, so it makes a, a very unique sealing closure. Um, cork is actually impermeable to gases and liquids, which a lot of people don't realize, um, but that's how it keeps the wine in the bottle. And so it protects the wine from outside elements as well. Um, which is unique. Some other closures, closures don't do that. Um, so cork does provide that, that seal. Now it also um, enables wine aging and development. Now this kind of, um, it helps the wine phenolics to develop with time because the cork, and I'll show you a, a better photo, but because the cork is porous and has small amounts of oxygen, that oxygen is able to um, exchange with the wine and smooth out the tannins. And so that's kind of how the wine, um, how cork helps wine age and develop, is that um, oxygen. And it's sustainable. So that's all the reasons that I always encourage uh, wonderful customers to use natural cork. And so this was the picture, this is one of my favorite photos. So this is actually a microscopic photo of what cork looks like. Um, so cork is actually 70% air, and so hence why it's so light, it floats, and that's what makes cork such a unique sealing um, closure for the wine industry. Because as we know, with slow controlled oxygen, mm. wine can continue to develop um, different tertiary and phenolic flavors that actually make the wine better with age. So has everyone taken a sip of their delicious, I heard 2011, 2014? Yeah, 2011. Making sure everybody... So it's an aged wine and it's, it's probably would taste very different than when you, if you had it back in 2012 or 2013 when it was first released. Um, and that's kind of smoothness and that integration is really in part, um, or is aided in part to the natural. Is that cool or not? Yeah, um, I labeled. Okay. And so, yeah, as we talked about, it is compressible, um, it's resilient, and it's impervious, and which, which is what makes it um, an, all those important characteristics for a closure. Um, it's really pretty fan interesting. When we get the corks from before bottling, they're like this big, and then, well, not quite that big, but they're this big, and then to go in the bottle, they squish down quite a bit. So it's like, with this honeycomb material, it's like taking a sponge, and um it has some jaws there there's um metal yeah, there yeah. metal jaws within the corker that compress the cork and push it into the bottle so it's a, yeah it's a, and then it expands again to to seal it to seal so it. it's um it's really it's really kind of crazy oh dad's got a comment yeah it's unique the fact my that question is how do you how do you get the cork off of the tree? You began to show that process with that special ax, but um, what do they do? Cut a, a strip of bark around the tree a couple of feet wide and then just go step up the trunk and out the... Exactly, and then they, they work it up so they would create cut lines around the top, cut lines around the bottom, and then a seam up the tree and as wholly as they can peel off the bark, they actually create two seam lines. So um, on either side of the tree. And so they pull it off in two pieces. So there must be a natural point that that ax blade can go in to start that stripping. It is, I mean, oak, oak, ha I mean, it has the natural stri striations and this isn't a, a dense bark. So an ax, like a, a well-trimmed blade would be able to make an indention um, to start peeling off the bark. Okay. I have a question. How many corks do you order at the beginning of a season? Um, how many do we order? We yeah, order for, for your bottles. Yeah. Well, we order depending on how much, um, because they're like a sponge and they have to have the right moisture content in order to compress and expand the way that, that, that works to, um, 
we will order the appropriate number of bottles. So carriage house is usually 800 to 1,000 cases of wine. So if I have, what did we do last week? 800 and, 822. No, 882. We did 882. I had 896 cases of glass. So I ordered, um, I ordered that many corks plus a little bit of extra because you never want to run out. Sure. And then we actually take the extra and we'll send them back and they get rehydrated because that moisture content is really, really important. And so it's, it's just in time manufacturing or for us, because we can't order them. We can't order them in January and use them throughout the year. We order them. They come a week or two before we bottle in about the right quantity with just a little bit of extra. And then, um, I'm actually getting ready because we bottled the carriage house and we haven't bottled the, the coat yet. I'll take all of the, the leftovers and we'll send them back and get them reprocessed and, and they'll rehydrate, they'll get the moisture levels right. They'll make sure they're hundred percent clean and there's nothing, there's nothing that can contaminate the next bottlings of wine. And then um, they'll, we'll get them back like a week or two before, before we go into the bottle again. Interesting. Thank you. Um, yeah, and human. Well, this is I. This is a little bit more of uh, kind of. This is talks about oxygen transmission, um, and so the difference with natural cork versus other closures, um, and the rate in which uh, oxygen can access wine at certain points. So this is really important for um, when I'm talking to Carrie uh, for her bottling and controlling that right at the start. Um, hold on, just one second. So with I'm all over the place here. So as we mentioned um, with wine aging and development, and I just saw someone put through a question, but I'm having trouble. How do you maintain? Oh, mo moisture during shipping, they're shipped in plastic bags. They're sealed. They're, they're sealed, they're sealed bags that, that keep the moisture constant and keep the humidity constant when they're coming. And they don't come from Portugal, the, the final, um, moisture and the the Copanaville the logo of the house gets put on the wine in California so it only has to come up from Napa so it doesn't take okay. very long to get to us in transport mm -hmm. so then the question is if cork allows for wines to age would you say screw cap wines really aren't ageable wines is, is Co on <laughs> <laughs> yeah we should ask Co that question if he's here Oh, but he's not. So, oh yeah, he is. All right, Co. I'll let, because there are different schools of thought. There are um, there are different trains of thought on on will wines age under a screw cap or under a cork. And Co studied this as much as anybody. So go ahead and give him your two cents. Am I on? Am I live here? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, Yes, I've done a lot of research with uh, screw caps over the years, and probably not, that's a whole other uh, session uh, that we should do. <laughs> this is probably the, the not the place to do it, but yes, ab absolutely. Research in, Ameri in the United States, uh, some of which I've been part of, as well as Australia, New Zealand, and Switzerland show that screw caps, uh, wines uh, bottled with screw caps age beautifully and appropriately as well. So uh, let's do that on a different time. I think there's there's uh, there are several very good closures. Cork, good corks do a great job. So uh, let's finish talking about good corks and uh, what a great job they do. And then on another day, we'll talk about screw caps because we both bottle with screw caps as well too. Mm -hmm. And screw caps, if you go back to that, Michelle, can you go back to that oxygen transfer rate slide for a sec? Because there's a couple different attributes of what makes wine age. If you serve, sealed it in a hermetically sealed, no, no oxygen, no gas transfer, all nothing changed, wine will still change because there are a lot of chemical reactions. It's a very, very complex chemical mixture and including you've got water, you've got ethanol, which is, you know, we like the ethanol. That's, that's also how we stay safe during COVID, you know, that keeps us disinfected from the inside. 
And, um, but it's got a lot of all of the flavor compounds, all of the, the phenolics, all these different things are always changing in this mixture. And they change differently depending on how much oxygen there is. So as you can see in this slide, there's, um, this shows how much oxygen there is per year. And one of the reasons it's important to have really good cork is it lowers the variability. And um, one of the advantages to screw caps is that you have, they're, they're not, I mean, cork is a natural product, just like wine is a natural product. And so you have variability and we love the vintage variability in the, in the wines. We don't love it so much in the closures. So that's one of the advantages of using a screw cap is that they're very, very consistent. However, if you look at how wines age in screw cap over cork, there's different oxygen ingress levels. So they're different, they're going to age differently. So we've uh, not done as much research as Co has, but we've done some research on screw caps versus corks. With our wines. With our wines. Mm -hmm. I've done um, a lot of tastings of Coravin versus wines that have been on the Coravin for a long time, which is not 100% the same, but if you look at how these wines taste in different environments, um, they do age differently and they do taste differently. And so one of the, one of the reasons that, that we like the very traditional closure for our very traditional wines is that if you're gonna open a bottle of wine from 2011, it's nine years old, you have an idea in your head, what is a bottle of wine that's nine years old gonna taste like? And that is, it does take some getting used to what is some, I mean, every time you change, make these changes, the whole ball of wax changes. And so in some ways, Scott, we always need help with research. <laughs> We're scientists, more research is always better. <laughs> um, but I think one of the, the things that's, that's important about, for us, with these very classic, I mean, they're very classic traditionally styled wines and a very, very traditional old world philosophy is, um, is to not make everything too dynamic, too innovative. We try to keep a lot of things the same to highlight that one variable, which is the, the site, because we feel that that site is really important and really special. And um, so it's a little bit it's a little different where Co has a very Co has a little bit different philosophy. He's got a lot more, more. He's got different variables. He's got different, um, and it depends. I mean, when I worked in Australia, everybody, all the fine wines at the time were bottled under um, screw caps because of the risk of TCA. And um, one of the reasons that as Co mentioned, good cork is important, is that um, you, the good cork producers like Amram have worked over time to minimize the TCA. Um, the, uh, they, they've changed things in the forest, just like when we wanted to change something in the wine, we'd like to go back to the vineyard. They've changed how they work in the forest as um, they were looking at the trees. They don't, not all the bark comes off. Well, they used to go lower down, but because a lot of the precursors for TCA are down at the bottom of the tree, they, they, there's a lot more testing of those sorts of things. Um, and then there's a lot of, I mean, there's a lot of different ways to make, to make these things. Like, um, yeah, Barb brings up, there's the, there's the natural cork that is one piece of cork, like the corks that we use that are in the bottles that you, or that you should have pulled out of the bottle carriage house tonight. But um, I have on my desk, because I don't have the cork because we decanted, I have an agglomerated cork, which is all the cork bits and dust that are put together. This is a champagne cork, but, um, or a sparkling cork, but the, that's going to be different. You're not going to have the same kind of integrity in the cork that you are from a single piece of wood. And so um, all of those things affect how oxygen transfers. But, you know, we kind of think this, if they're all glued together, like the DMs and the 
then you're not really using the natural closure, which is that single piece of cork, which is a very, because what we're trying to do is is that continuity and that natural process with really high quality materials we that's why we use those those the, they only take the best pieces of bark to do the single punch corks so um so as with all things as we're learning every week there are quality differentiations of all the all the levels and um so let me see did i miss any questions did michelle miss any questions no, and I just wanted to add that is um, Carrie and Coach touched on a huge uh, challenge and that the industry has really had to face in the past probably 10 to 20 years is that TCA, as I'm sure many of you wine enthusiasts have, have heard that acronym, um, it's a compound that can disrupt not only the aromatic properties, but also the, the taste of your wine. And so one of the places it can be found is in cork. And so that is a problem that the industry, it can just be winery, it can be in cork. It happens when a, a mold can come in contact with chlorine and it forms a compound. Um, but cork is one of the or cork is a place that you can find it. And so for a long time that the cork industry has been plagued um, by TCA. And rightfully so, it's um, you know, a, a frustrating thing to spend so, you know, so much time tending to your, your grapes on the vine, producing this beautiful wine, putting it in bottle, um, only to have off aromas and off flavors that you didn't intend to, to be in the bottle. Um, so as they both mentioned that there are reasons and purposes for different closure types. Um, I mean, and there's a, I'm, Carrie probably has a checklist of 20 to 30 things she's, she's thinking about when, um, you know, just thinking about a closure, thinking about the glass, thinking about the package in general. Um, and that's not to say cork is not the best solution, one size fits all, um, but there are a lot of benefits and, and some of the benefits are the, the sustainability aspect um, and then we are closing the gap. Um, I didn't want to make that. We are closing the gap as a company. Um, we have individually tested corks that we can screen for TCA, and we are um, getting close to what we call total eradication. So by the end of this year, we hope that every natural cork we sell um, will be totally eradicated of TCA. And so that's really the kind of the strength behind Amarum and our research and development team, because um, that's definitely that's been a huge challenge to the cork industry. Um, and that's what's brought up technical corks, and that's the ground up. Um, and so, yeah, so it's really exciting to see what's what's going to come about of it. And um, you know, in in addition, I'm giving a cork presentation here, but I also sell glass closures too. So there's a lot of different closure types. Um, but I know cork is is so unique, and and as Carrie mentioned at the beginning, it's kind of some, something that most people don't give a second thought to. Um, so sharing a little bit, you know, of the uniqueness and individuality of the, the closure, I think is, uh, yeah, I was hoping to share with you a part of the forest today. And so as we mentioned with the wine, it does um, help to the maturation process. So it helps to soften those tannins, help add that complexity and create that bottle bouquet. And so getting down to kind of the molecular side of it, so similar to some of the properties or phenolics you'd find in an oak barrel are going to be some of the similar properties that you're going to find in cork. Um, and so again, smaller surface area, it's not gonna have as dramatic of an impact, but we've done multiple studies um, specifically on champagne. So champagne is aged twice during its um, production process. Um, and so we've done multiple studies on aging champagne with natural cork discs versus non, and the phen phenolic development of not only the bouquet, but also the, uh, the flavor profile. So definitely that, that natural cork in contact adds a, adds not only the ageability with the oxygen, but also a, a small amount with the absorption of phenolic compounds. And so this is kind of a, a fun fact. So every time you open a bottle of wine, you're actually holding a piece of cork that's at least 50 years old. Um, so that's how long it takes these trees to come into productive maturity. So before they can even be harvested for the first time, they have to be 25 years old. And then we get the first virgin harvest, which you can't use, and we grind all that up and use it in other sources. And then you actually have to harvest it two more times in order to have quality cork that you can punch out to put in a wine bottle. So it's kind of a, a fun fact I'll close on. Um, but like I said, thank you all so much. All right, well, so I wanna go back to the rest, some of the other questions. Adrish asks, are all the names that aren't screw cap or natural cork variants of synthetic cork? 
there are uh, for spending a time learning bazillion low stressors. I mean, it, there are, you can have natural corks where they're agglomerated and then you have just slivers of cork. They're called like, you can have a cap on the top, a cap on the bottom, two caps on the top, on top and bottom, just one side. You can have glass corks, you can have um, plastic corks, you can have the punched out corks, you can basically- I mean, Enclosures instead of corks though. Just oh, that's true. Is well, natural cork and then, but plastic closures, glass closures. That's true. That's how I try not to confuse. <laughs> Which is, it's also a good point considering that since we were talking about TCA, which is the compound, it's the impact compound that we call a corked bottle of wine. It's, I actually did a thing on cork years ago in Seattle and I went out to breakfast the next morning and they put lemon in my water carafe and I'm like, this is corked. And they said, what are you talking about? I'm like, this, there's TCA in my water because the lemon yeah. was cork. Baby carrots, do not, if you love wine, for the love of God, do not eat baby carrots. They are always corked across the board. Smell your produce before you buy it. Apples too. Because oh. apples are corked. Radishes are, the radishes in my grocery store are the worst. I mean, that's where I get it all the time. Because mm -hmm. anytime you have mold, and as Michelle was saying, if you have um, yeast or mold or, and microbes and bleach, I mean, we all know we're all using bleach to clean things because they kill bugs. Well, the bugs aren't real happy about it. So if you have phenolic material like cork or, or like, um, like wood, so pallets or anything, anything with a phenol, basically, um, the, the wood boxes that they ship the bananas up from, up in, the, it's a really, really efficient mechanism for the yeast to be like, oh, okay, I'm gonna take that bleach and I'm gonna put it on this phenol and then I don't have to deal with it. And a phenol is a six chain carbon. So they just go, okay, well, I'll put one here, skip one, one here, skip one, one here. And it's three detoxifications for the price of one. It is super efficient. So, um, so we shouldn't be, we should be very specific with our, with our verbiage usage. But yeah, there's a wide wide variety of closures and, and, and cork is one way of introducing the TCA into your winery. But you can cork your entire winery or get TCA in your entire winery and contaminate the whole thing. So you can have TCA infected wines even if you don't use, if you use glass stoppers. It's, um, it's, it's another thing that it's important to understand the microbiology and the, and the chemistries of it's why we don't clean with bleach in the winery. Um, and then Kevin had asked, how do we maintain or hold cork, cork moistures on the bottling line? Well, so what we do is they come in bags of, well, the, for, I don't know if it's the way, this way for all size wineries, because we're little, but we get bags of a thousand corks. And we do 30 bottles a minute about on the, on the bottling line. So we'll take the corks, open the bag, put them in the, in the hopper and they come out one for the corker. And we go through them quickly enough that they stay pretty constant over the course of a bottling run. Um, and that's important, that's important in bottling because just like, just like if you're washing dishes and you take a sponge, you have to get it wet in order to get it flexible enough to, to mold to the dishes. If a cork is too dry, it won't compress and it also won't seal. So it needs, but if it's too wet, you have too much moisture, it's, it doesn't work as well either. So it has to be in that perfect range. And so we ask for quality control specs and get all the, get all the, tech, the specifications that the corks are checked for and their moistures are in this range. And we have um, our, the bottling line that we have, Adrish was talking about Bill a couple weeks, couple weeks ago and he's you can stab the cork and um, there's a put a probe in it in on the bottling line and check the moisture and uh, we will do that to make sure that everything is consistent it's in spec and it's working the way we want it to because either we have to react or we will I mean, we've at times we've gone we won't use this bag of corks which 
is a challenge when you're bottling. But um, again, this is why it's important to have good suppliers know what you're doing and have that open line of communication to make sure that everything is everything is the way you expect it to be. It's it's perfect. It's ready to go when when you're using it because this is um, it is very time sensitive with with a lot of with something like. I mean, labels, you have issues with adhesives and paper and all the other things, but you can order your labels two months ahead of time and it's not a big deal. And um, the, the, the corks are a critical, it's, it's very time sensitive because they're, I mean, just like when you're washing dishes, you don't want too much water in your sponge, you don't want not enough water in your sponge. Um, Kevin, let me know if that didn't answer your question. And then, I do not know, Tony, what happened with Cayuse when they lost a vintage of wines because of a cork problem. I don't know. I know as much as, I mean, I just saw the emails they sent out. Michelle, do you know what happened? No, that was before my time. So, um, yeah, I thought, I mean, that's, I, I can't, I can't imagine. <laughs> so. Why, why don't we go clean with bleach? Um, Barb. Oh, Barb, why don't we, um, oh wait, what's the approximate price range for a cork? Huge. You can get corks, pen well, Michelle, you probably know this better than I do. Pennies to a buck a cork. Yeah, so some of our highest end corks can go all the way up to $2. Um, so it's going to be like a 54 <laughs> highest, highest grade. So super long and super pretty. And then um, I would say for a good cork, yeah, you start around maybe 35 to 45 cents. Um, based on grade and quality, but there's a bunch of, you know, options and grades and things in between. That's for natural cork. So technical cork, there are others. So, so obviously, if you're using a, if you're selling your wine for, in the grocery store for less than $10, you're not going to put a dollar or $2 cork in it because there's just, that just doesn't work. Um, uh, but it's, yeah, they go, it can be a big, so it can be, they can be pretty expensive. There's a pretty wide range. Co, did you have a thought on that? Yeah, some of our large formats too go up to $8 a quart, you know, for like a three or a six liter. Because again, you have to have a quality, you have to have a single piece of bark without any sort of striations or imperfections. I don't, I, I mean, my camera quality is not the best here, but. Yeah. Then any sort of striations or imperfections and um, to, to be a proper seal. So corks, um, yeah, they're pretty unique um, what they find with the quality. So this is Barb. One of my, like when Carrie, when you and I went to Portugal, we went to the cork first. One of the biggest, not the biggest things, I'm so not scientific. I'm like totally on the X, I'm not the, I'm on the totally opposite that I was really surprised. Like we went through the cork for us, like, I bought shoes with cork, and if you go buy shoes with cork, they're so expensive, but that's the cheapest cork because they peel the tree, they, they peel the layers when it's like the most porous. And by the time they get to the uh, cork for the wine, it's like so many years, but I was surprised. Like you go buy shoes or purses that are cork, and they're so expensive, that's the cheapest cork. That, that's not even wine cork. Wine cork is like years and years before it's a wine cork. So. I'm surprised that that was kind of crazy for me. Yeah, well, and, and the cork and floors and they had, it was, when we were in Portugal, they had like rain jackets and umbrellas and I mean, all sorts of, it's, it's a really cool material when you start looking at what else you can put cork into. Um, but the, why, what do we clean with? So we don't clean with bleach because of, the potential for TCA. So um, what we do clean with is uh, we use a variety of cleaners. We actually rotate our cleaners at various points because um, if you only clean with one thing, micro, you don't get all your different microbes. So we normally use an oxygenated, like OxyClean really, which does a combination of it cleans and it sanitizes. Um, but then once or twice a year, we'll go through and scrub everything out with caustic soda. 
like so, sodium hydroxide basically and scrub all the, remove all the biofilms and it's, um, and make sure that everything's clean. We'd use a lot of stainless steel in the winery to make sure that we don't, that everything is inherently cleanable. I mean, one of the challenges, those, those giant wood aging vessels look really cool, but they're not inherently cleanable. Plastic is not inherently cleanable. So we don't, because the surfaces, you can't clean the surface. And when you get down to that basic, like, can you clean, can you actually clean it or not? Concrete tanks and fermentation vessels, those concrete eggs, not cleanable. And, um, and so if what you're trying to do is showcase the wine in your vineyard and not we like to showcase the terroir of the vineyard, not the terroir, the microbial terroir of the winery floor. And so therefore sanitation is hugely important to us. Um, a lot of the wineries that use, that are, that use more um, native yeasts and more things that are indigenous to their wineries, sanitation is not as important because they want those, bye dad, he's gotta go change water. <laughs> um, um, you're really looking at what's indigenous to your winery, not so much what is what's indicative of your vineyard per se in in our opinion. Um, wine barrels can have TCA as well. You can have TCA anytime you have microbes and chlorine, bromine, anything in that part of the, that part of the periodic table, any any of those halogens and um and phenol because that's the mechanism that the microbes use to detoxify their environment and put it on phenol so any which is why bananas get tca and radishes get tca and apples get tca and it's it's pretty endemic i mean if you aren't real confident with your ability to associate that smell go smell baby carrots mm -hmm. they are always a hundred percent because baby carrots are carrots that they shave down and they do it in water with chlorine so that you, your carrots are safe to eat. But every, it's actually a kind of a challenge. They're saying, my uh, sensory professor at Davis was say, telling me that um, the, new, the new kids these days who were all raised on baby carrots don't, they're not aware, they, can't, they don't even notice it. It's very hard for them to detect it and be aware of it because that's one of the things in sensory. Do you, do you, can you sense it? And then does your brain recognize and acknowledge what it is? And a lot of kids these days, it's such a thing they grew up with. They don't, they don't think about it. They don't realize it's there. Um, and TC, just to, but I always, um, TC is on a scale as well. So there are levels and they measure in parts per trillion. Um, so, you know, not all TCA is the same and it can be in varying concentrations. And, and again, I, I always, uh, I love sharing about natural cork, but this always comes up, but it is such a small percentage and it's becoming smaller and smaller too, um, as the industry and, and, um, quality winemakers and our screening becomes higher and higher. We're able to now screen with using gas chromatography, for instance. So we're now able to screen down to 0.5 parts per trillion. Um, which is like a, a drop of a drop of water in a in a swimming pool. So that's kind of the level uh, of screening and ability that that we are refining down to. So it's it's quite impressive, but it is um, as Carrie mentioned, it can be very potent in very small amounts. I mean, two parts per trillion. That's that's pretty tiny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's one of the things about sensory that's interesting is where's that threshold and where's the there's two things there's a can you detect it and then do you know what it is there's a recognition threshold and and this is not i mean this is everything i have a friend who um <laughs> we were doing a riesling panel and um somebody stuck a impact compound for one of the floral aromatics of riesling pure isolated citronella or something i don't know took the vial of compound and stuck it under his nose and he goes i don't smell anything and so there's we all have things we can't smell we all have things we're more or less susceptible to and again wine is such a complex 
mix of compounds and chemicals and matrix effects and and then you throw in food and wine pairings and it's it's part of what makes it so completely fascinating is that it is so amazingly complex and um and and that's one of the the beauties of having um that's one of the beauties of wine and because we have more to learn every every day every week every bottle of wine we open um if you get a bottle of wine that is corked send it back it's it's on us it's on the suppliers and honestly i want to know because if i mean the the goal is that every single bottle is perfect if you get a bottle that's not perfect I want to know about it so then I can go back and bug Aaron, bug Michelle and say, you need to do a better job because that's what really caused the, the, a lot of this research and development is that consumers started saying this isn't okay. And, and so we want to know, so take it back to, if you get in a restaurant, that's, that's why when you go to a restaurant, they give you a taste. It's not to see, did you, did you like this bottle? Is it really what you wanted to drink tonight? Did the song give you the best recommendation that you wanted ever, ever, ever in your, in your best life? It's, you ordered something and you're like, is it, is it off? Is it flawed? And if it is, then if you send it back to the restaurant, they send it back to the distributor who sends it back to the winery. And, um, and it's what, it keeps us honest. It, it helps Helping to keep us honest helps to keep the our our cork our cork forest and our cork suppliers honest. So, so definitely, um, that's hopefully it's a bottle by bottle basis and not the Cayuse thing where it was an entire vintage. And again, I don't know what happened there. Um, moisture content you can restore moisture content. Michelle, can you talk for a second about how you reprocess corks? Um, we put them in a moisture room and so it rehydrates the cork. Um, and so, yeah, the high humidity uh, helps bring moisture into a certain content. And again, that's important um, for insertion and extraction because a typical cork, as Carrie mentioned, when, when we send them corks, they're 24 millimeters in diameter. She compresses it all the way to about 15 millimeter, 15.5 millimeters in bottling, and then the cork expands back out to 18.5 in the bottle. So it has to do a lot of movement and flexibility and it needs the proper moisture in order to maintain its mechanical performance. Yeah. Um, bleach with regular usage will deteriorate stainless. Kevin, that's a good tip. I had no idea. It's another reason not use bleach. <laughs> um, and Tony, when you send cork wine back, will you taste it to check to see if I refilled it with two buck chuck? Well, now I will. <laughs> Got my eye on you. <laughs> I wouldn't have, but now I will. <laughs> so, all right. We, <laughs> um, all right. Any other? Edie, what your hands raised? Where, uh, where'd she go? Hold on, hold on. We gotta unmute you. Spacebar. Hit spacebar. There you go. I couldn't figure out how to type a question, so I thought I would just ask. Sometimes, I, when I get a taste of wine at wherever, I feel like it's the glass that smells off. I don't know if it's the actual wine that tastes bad, but in the tasting of the wine in the glass, it's off. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, yeah, <laughs> if your glass isn't clean, if you've got detergent stuff, I mean, and the, yeah. the worst is, I mean, I don't know why they sell the detergent, the laundry, or not the laundry, laundry soap, washing. worse than dishwasher soap, but I mean, why is everything scented for God's sakes? It's horrible. <laughs> yeah. It's, I, you, I, somebody gave me some dish soap one time that smells like pears. All my dishes come out of the dishwasher smelling like pears. Well, okay, maybe that works with my Riesling, but it doesn't work with my carriage house. So <laughs> mm -hmm. across the board, use unscented everything. And if you hand wash your, your wine glasses and then you leave them to dry, don't put them on a towel because mm -mm. then, they then they smell moldy and funky and then your wine smells moldy and funky. 
you know, that's what must happen. It's not usually at my house, but like if I'm out at a restaurant or something and you smell, it's like, ooh. Yeah. Aaron. Yeah. But Aaron. Okay. Yeah, speak, we'll speak to that. Is he cooking? What you wash your glass? Uh, most important, you can put the greatest wine in the world in a stinky glass and it's going to smell like the stinky glass. Yeah. Um, we um, polish uh, every wine glass a second time right before it goes down onto the table. And quite often, you know, our director of operations and I were having a conversation of what does service look like going forward. One of the things that I do is I sniff every decanter before I decant wine into it. Mm -hmm. Now, am I going to be able to still do that? Um, who knows? However, I once had a guest ask me, when they saw me sniffing the decanter, they said, what are you smelling? What are you, what are you hoping it smells like? And I said, absolutely nothing. I'm hoping it smells like nothing. That's the goal. We want a neutral. I would rather put a spotty glass down that is neutral odor than an absolutely shiny glass that smells like a dirty polishing cloth. So yeah, I think that that's an absolutely important thing to, to address and to, and to uh, think about. Yeah, and I think it goes back to kind of what Adrish was talking about a couple weeks ago that you know this is wine making at a high level is really pretty simple you take grapes you add yeast you get wine it's you don't even have to add yeast right you, they ferment themselves um and so i mean my niece made wine when she was five it is not rocket science but all of these details at every step along the way and with all of our suppliers and with all of when you go to the restaurant that's why it's it's all of these things add up and in many ways there's so many things that you don't even think about which is why i think it's so cool that you guys are interested in hearing all these things that you don't normally think about that really add to the experience and the enjoyment um why does a cork harvest start on the first moon of may i have no idea I mean, if I had to guess, I would assume it has to do with water tables, but that would be, I do not know. As I do know that the cork tree is- Biodynamic question. <laughs> I do know that you can't harvest any time. Like the tree has to be, so which- Water absorption, yeah, and the tree to, to make it peel off from the bark is what my first guess. But again, like I said, I haven't had the chance to to walk through those forests myself so well they um the corks i they when when we were when we were there they said they actually knock the tree and smell it because what happens is you have the bark of the outer part of the tree is um basically the trunk of a tree is a giant straw you have water going up and then you have water coming back down and the where the the outer layer of where the that happens is what actually disconnects the bark from the inside straws of the tree and um and it's uh it when the tree is ready and i don't 100 percent know what that entails you can actually that's when you can come apart and not kill the tree if you harvest the cork at the wrong time you'll break the cambium and actually kill the tree so it's a very, as Michelle was saying, it's very technically skilled labor. Some of the highest level of, um, I know Adrish mentioned what, what's the epitome of quality control at various points. One of the, one of the most important jobs in the, in the forest is taking the bark off the tree without killing it. Oh, and they harvest, it's funny, uh, there, you could see it, one of them in that picture that Michelle showed. You, you go through the forest and um, I was trying to find a picture of this, but all the trees have numbers written on them. Just one, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Because anything that was harvested this year, they'll put a zero, I think they put a zero on it because it was harvested in 2020, or they'll put a nine because it's ready to go in nine years and then in the year i think they put a nine so if you harvest it this year you harvest again in nine years and they write a nine on the tree so all the trees are numbered <laughs> you drive around the forest is everybody graffiti the trees with numbers and so then in year nine 
all the trees that have a nine on them, they get harvested in year nine. And then next year, like in year, because we're in zero, in year one, everything that has a one on it will get harvested. And then they go through and harvest and then they write on the tree again. And so it'll get a zero next time. And then the next time it gets a one and the next time it gets a two. And um, it's like an act of, you can't take out a cork tree. It's, you have to apply to the government or something because they are, as Michelle was saying, protected. It's a protected species. And um, so they live, I mean, we saw trees that were 250 years old. And it's, oh, and is Barb still here? Yes. Barb, you remember lunch? You remember that lunch after the... Which lunch? We had a lot of lunches. <laughs> <laughs> so in the, so the, the forests are really fascinating because they, it's a mix of, they do the trees and they're oak trees. So they have acorns and the acorns fall down. And yes, they yes, pigs, yes. The pigs. The pigs that are, eat the acorns and yeah. Um, and so you get the acorn finished pigs and they also have agriculture and it's all happening in the same place. And, yeah. um, so you get these amazing, it was probably, I thought it was like the best lunch of the trip was the pigs. It was, it was so amazing. That was so amazing with the acorns when they eat on the acorn. It was so amazing. Cause they just, they just hang out in the cork forest and that's all they eat. Yeah, so next time you, when you can fly, when we can travel again and we can fly, I highly recommend lunch in Southern Portugal. Yeah, let's highly. go. <laughs> so. All right, did I miss, did we miss any questions? I don't know, we're losing some people to time constraints. I don't know how much time yeah, you guys will have. I wanted to know, which I, I, I asked this question because I, I love your wine, Carrie, but sometimes you go to a restaurant and they have those stupid chemical dishwashers where they put the wine glasses in and then they put you a glass of wine and it's so terrible mm -hmm. so when you go to a, a nice restaurant and they hand you a glass of wine that the glass has just been through a chemical dishwasher and it changes the wine like Aaron what do you do about that we're asking Aaron because I don't know if you know Aaron he is in charge of the wine program at the Met Grill so first and foremost oh, you're always oh. safe with the Met well so <laughs> So you know we have a we have a reservation for my husband on June thirteenth for his sixtieth birthday for twelve people. So <laughs> you better be open. <laughs> yeah, we do. I think it's going to be canceled, but <laughs> three different tables of four people to make that. Happen. Yeah, well we're we're open to doing that, so we'll be your best friends if you let us do that. We've had reservations there for like six months for his sixtieth birthday, so to be very clear. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, they let me be in charge of the wine and absolutely nothing else. <laughs> um, we're fine with just wine. But, so, but what should you? What should Barb do if she gets a glass that is funky at a restaurant? So, it, uh, honestly, the long, the short, long story short is that she should send it back with the specific comment of. You know, this smells like glass cleaner to me. Sometimes we're a very, very, very busy restaurant. And uh, the goal is to never have a glass go through the dishwasher to a table. Sometimes that is the only glass that is left to go to a table. So at that point, you know, at, at a restaurant like the Metropolitan Grill, if you think of that happening, the, you should turn to your server and say, you know, I, I this smells like glass washer and I'm willing to wait for a couple minutes to get a clean and dry glass. Um, but sometimes it does mean that it will be a couple minutes wait. We have oh, seven, eight hundred wine glasses on the floor at any given time at the Metropolitan Grill and sometimes even that isn't enough. So um, it, 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 that can be an issue in a really busy restaurant at a really busy time, but I would just say if you're not comfortable talking to your server about it, talk to the, the wine captain or the sommelier about it and say, you know, I, I love this wine and I know this wine, and right now it just smells like uh, chlorine glass, and that's not what it should smell like. And any decent uh, sommelier or wine captain will probably agree with you. Yeah, Tony has a good point too to smell the glass when you um, when they put it down. when they put it put down it on the table. Yep. Yep. Um, all right, well, 
I'm really glad you guys had a lot of questions today. Next week, we have a request that you send suggestions ahead of time. So put your thinking caps on while they're still wine in your glass. Because <laughs> that makes everybody more creative. And I know you're all. Oh, Scott, you need more. Oh, boy. Emergency, emergency. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. The night's a pup, even a minute, even a couple hours ahead of us. So you're ready to go. The um, you can get another bottle. It'll work. The um, so Harvey Simon is going to talk next week. Um, he is the he was one of the um, editors of the Wine Spectator before he retired, and so but he did ask for questions ahead of time. Now I will say that this suggestion came from Paul who didn't come tonight, but, um, and Robin sent me some great suggestions as well, and many of them are upcoming, so good tips. Um, but if you guys have, if you there's something that you wanna know, burning desires, burning thoughts, send us tips. Burning if, recipes you wanna share? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Mom, <laughs> Mom would love the recipes. Step right up. <laughs> um, and we have some from, no, back at the beginning with Riesling. I need to revisit Riesling because Hazel had sent some uh, Riesling recipes that looked really great. So, um, uh, but for, Harvey did ask for questions ahead of time. So put your thinking caps on, send us what you want to know. He will appreciate it. Yeah, just pop us an email. Yeah. And um, also, if, as Tony said, one day a week is not enough after our virtual vineyard tours quit. Becky, stop laughing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah friday at five i'm gonna be live on instagram with uh owen bargreen from washington wine blog we're tasting it's more of this is happy hour that's more of a wine tasting but if you want to do wine tasting um no limits on questions ask whatever questions you want for next wednesday or any wednesday yeah i mean it's happy hour she's got the mute button it's not a big deal <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so Harvey's Harvey will be talking about um being a critic, what it's like to be a critic and his experience with 20 some years at the Wine Spectator. So um we are going to um I'm a writer. He's not just a critic. I mean, no, he's, he's a writer. A writer. He's yeah. a great writer. He's yeah. written some phenomenal things. Yeah. And um he was a food writer, he's wine writer, he wrote about baseball for a little bit. So um this is the guy you want to have for dinner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, um so we want we want questions. Um and we want suggestions and we love, we love the feedback. So five o'clock Instagram live, you can tune in from following us or Washington wine blog. We're going to be tasting. I think we're going to do the Rose Syrah and the train station red so, or cab. I don't remember. <laughs> oh, I sent him some wine. I wrote it down. Whatever, whatever I remember to taste. That's what we'll, whatever I, what my thought was last week, we'll taste that on, uh, on Friday. So show up, that'll be fun. And um, yeah, I think that's, we're good. I love you too, Barb. There's no mute button on chat. <laughs> there is no mute button on chat. We are, um, oh, Ed, enjoy the port. Let us know how it is. And uh, we will see you guys all next week. Michelle, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. Yes, thank if you. If you wanna come next week, you're more than welcome to join us. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you all. I hope you all have a great evening. All right. All have right. a great evening, guys. Bye, guys.